What's up guys, this is Jan for Chess24. I'm coming to you from Crete in Greece, where I'm currently doing live commentary on the European Team Chess Championship. But we shall interrupt that coverage to have a look at another team event, the Chinese Chess League. And the reason we're doing that is because Mr. Ding Liren, the World Cup finalist, the Chinese number one, I believe currently the number 11 in the world, played an absolute masterpiece of a game with the black pieces against his young compatriot Bai Jinshi. Here we see him seated, the, I believe, 18, 19 year old, born in 1999, versus Ding Liren standing there. Now, normally I don't like to spoil the results of a game going in, but this one, I believe, is worth it to just lean back and enjoy Ding Liren's wizardry. You're in for quite a ride. The game started as a theoretical debate in the Nimzo Indian. Bai Jinji, by no means a pushover. Most 18 year olds, 25, 85 players, are not. And he came armed for this game with a fresh idea. He played the Knight of Three Line against the Nimzo Indian. Ding Liren played Castles, which is a move I also recommended in my video series, A Black Repertoire. <clears throat> against 1d4 on chess 24, where I covered the Nimzo Indian. After bishop to g5, this was considered to be a little better for white, because here it's tough for black to break this pin. Let's say you go h6, bishop h4, g5. Now we've weakened our own ki king. Therefore, typically people did not like castles. That started with b6 or c5 in this position. However, things have changed. Ding Liren of course, aware of the latest developments here, goes for the move c5, goes for quick counterplay in the center, and computers have shown that even with our king on g8, in many lines, we can get away with playing h6, g5. e3 played by Bai Jinji, c takes d4, and here the move that has been played by far the most is the move e takes d4, which looks the most logical as well, trying to maintain the pawn center, after which the theoretical debates are still ongoing. Check my series for details. I believe black is doing quite all right after d5. However, Bai Jinji played a fresh move. The move queen takes d4. I just checked the database. This has only been played in one game between weaker players. And it looked like Ding Liren was on his own fairly quickly here. I also have never seen this move. Queen takes d4. It doesn't look that critical because of the knight c6. White has to move his queen again, which is, of course, not ideal. But there is method to the madness. After queen to d3, black figures that white figures that this structure is a little unpleasant for black, and he will go to have to go to extreme measures to free his position. The bishop on c8 is passive, and if you go for d5, you typically will have to combine it with h6, g5, weakening your king, what we talked about, and it will lead to very messy complications where the better side prepare. The better prepared side typically has an edge. However, Ding Liren, not one to shy away from such complications, goes h6 followed by d5. White plays rook to d1, trying to point out that the black queen on d8 could be slightly misplaced on this d-file. And here black faces a choice. He could try to equalize with something like d takes c4, let's say queen takes c4, queen e7, when I guess white is a little better after bishop e2 or bishop d3. But that is not something that was on Ding's mind on this day. By the way, you can see if I'm analyzing, making my own little moves, then the green button will show up. Well, if we're following the game, there is no such thing. So g5 is the game. Ding immediately tries to free his knight for action, wants to jump into e4, paying the price of a weakened king on g8. Bishop g3, knight to e4. Threatening to increase his initiative now with queen a5 or queen f6. So by g in g does the correct thing and immediately breaks this pin by playing knight d2, also challenging the knight on e4. Black doesn't really want to take on g3, losing the momentum after hg, attacking the pawn on h6. Black would not be in great shape. Instead, Ding Liren keeps going at 100 miles an hour, plays knight to c5, attacks the white queen, queen to c2, and d4. Trying, yeah, first of all, to stop this nagging, c takes d5, and secondly, just to keep the initiative going. Of course, it would be a dream for white, for black, if white had to take e takes d4 and knight takes d4. But instead, Bai Jinji said, okay, 
I understand this looks nice and active for you, but what do you do after knight to f3? I will exploit this pin on the d-file, attack your d-pawn, and it doesn't look like you can keep that pawn. However, Ding Liren has no intention of keeping that pawn. His intention is to open the position to the max, and he does that by playing e6, e5. Actually, he does have intentions of keeping that pawn. He defends it by playing e5, but the e5 pawn is hanging. And this is a crucial moment in the game. After the move plate, which looks like the most logical move, the move knight takes e5, the rest becomes an absolute tour de force by Ding Liren and the reason we are here. But objectively, I haven't looked very deeply, my computer says that after bishop takes e5, white might be a little better. However, it looks very scary to play this over the board because after bishop e5, let's say knight e5, knight e5, queen f6, unpinning, e takes d4 and bishop f5. Black has sacrificed two pawns, but the white king is still in the center. The black pieces are developing extremely quickly. And it's not a surprise that Bai Jinji was not thrilled by this position. Would have to be analyzed more deeply to figure out who's better and why. My best guess is that the black initiative is enough to equalize at the end, but no more than that. Because he hasn't really done anything wrong so far, the white player. So after e5, Bai Jinji plays knight takes e5, and now the show begins. Ding Liren shows that he is not too worried about this pin, and he's willing to sacrifice quite some material in order to keep the initiative going. He starts with d takes c3, giving up his queen. Of course, white has to take, otherwise he'd just be a piece down. So rook takes d8, and he goes for a little Zwischenschach, intermediate check, in form of c takes b2 check which has to be done to justify this if black had recaptured after b takes c3. White would just be winning. c takes b2, and here Bai Jinji bravely but wrongly decides to put his king in the center, plays the move king to e2. That is just too risky. We'll see this king will soon get in trouble. A bad choice was to move rook to d2, trying to keep this rook alive for the moment. Cover the check. Of course, after rook d8, there would still be a lot of crumbs to solve for white. But this was the lesser evil. Knight to f3, bishop to g4, with fire on board. But it looks like white has some chances to survive here into an endgame. Let's say queen takes b2, bishop f3, gf, rook d2, queen d2, bishop d2, king d2. And all of a sudden, we will have an endgame where white is a pawn up. But even here, the black initiative would continue going. Could be that there were better choices for black along the way, but I'm sure Ding Liren was thrilled when he saw the move king e2 on the board after c takes b2, because now no end games, just attack. Rook takes d8, threatening, among other things, rook d2 now that this pawn is still alive. So Bai has no real choice but to eliminate it after this pawn falls. Black decides to transfer his knight to a slightly more active location on the c3 square. Well, we'll give a very nasty check, starting to point out that the white king does not have a lot of squares. Queen c2, more or less forced, knight c3 check, king f3, also the only move. You don't want to step into any discovered checks here on e1. So king to f3, and my guess is that Bai Jinji had calculated all this and had decided nothing too bad can happen to me. There's no real checks. If he goes h5, intending g4 check, I can always play h3. And otherwise, otherwise, what is black going to do? White is a queen up for a rook and a knight. And if he manages to conclude his development, he will have a winning position. But Ding Liren shows with his next move. Absolute hammer blow of a move. Maybe you want to pause the video and try to figure it out yourself. That the white king is not safe and will never be safe. He goes for... Rook to d4. This move threatens g5, g4, takes away all the squares on the fourth rank, and of course uses the fact that e takes d4, runs into knight takes d4 with a very nasty family fork. So rook d4, why does he do something? He has to address the threat of g4, followed by checkmate, and he goes h3, 
trying to cover that square. And also, sad but true, freeing the h2 square for his bishop so that the bishop can go there and free the g3 square for his king later. Because after a trick, Ding Liren keeps going, goes for h5, once again threatening g4, followed by hg, hg, uh, sorry for the arrows, knight g4, bishop g4, and checkmate. So we need a new square for the king. Only way to free one without losing a lot of material is bishop to h2, and black keeps pushing forward. g4 check, king to g3, including hg, hg, wouldn't really change things. The same trick would come because Ding Liren keeps playing this family fork piano. Is that an expression? Probably not. Um, and goes for rook to d2, when queen d2 would run into knight to e4. Therefore, the white queen begrudgingly has to abandon her coverage of the e4 square, has to go to b3, but that knight will joyfully jump here and ask the white king to join the joyride. Knight e4 check, white has a choice here. It's not a pleasant choice though, h4 or f4. White decides to go to h4. Let's have a brief look what would have happened after king to f4. Hmm. King f4, rook takes f2, king takes e4 forced. Bishop f5 check, king d5, rook d8 check, and knight d7, rook takes d7, checkmate. So that was not a pleasant final destination. Instead, the king went to the edge of the board, king to h4. But not surprisingly, it's also not really a safe haven. Still, you have to checkmate him. It's not straightforward. You can't just checkmate the king by giving checks here. But Ding figures out the way. He starts with bishop e7 check. The reply is forced. King takes h5. And even though this was not the only way to win the game, he plays a move that I enjoyed a lot. Remembering the good old rule that you should invite everybody to the party. And the only place that's really not doing all that much is the rook on a8. So Ding has figured out, you know what, if this rook were to give a check on h8, white would not like that very much. And he says, I have all the time in the world. I'll go king g7, then I want to put my bishop on f5 on e or e6, and then I want to checkmate you by going rook h8. These quiet moves are often really what makes these attacking games so beautiful. King g7, fantastic little move by Ding Liren. Bai g is in trouble here. You can try for yourself. For example, knight takes c6, runs into bishop to f5. Black doesn't need that many pieces. Knight takes e7, rook h8, and the game ends right here. So you have to invent something to defend against this check on h8. And Bajin G finds the most resilient move, goes bishop f4, trying to block that check by going bishop h6 check himself, and thereby blocking the h5. Bishop f5 anyway, the threat is not stronger than its execution, but it has to be parried. And bishop h6 check, king h7, and white is still facing, well, an uncertain future for his king. There, let's say we try some developing move like, like bishop to d3. There are a lot of problems still. Bishop g6 here, for example, knight g6, f g, king g4, knight f2 would pick up pretty much all of white's pieces with check. And of course, the knight on e5 is also on priest. Well, if we, let's say, try to take on c6, our king once again would not make it out alive. Hmm. Didn't happen. Instead, Bai Jinji thought, you know, might as well grab a pawn on b7. I'm pretty sure that's not what he thought, but he needs some counterplay and try to disorganize the black pieces. And queen b7 attacks the knight on c6, rook on a8. Not obvious how black can checkmate here, is it? Maybe it is obvious. For Ding Liren, he plays rook takes f2. Another sort of quiet move. It's not in order to win a pawn, but in order to create the threat of knight g3 checkmate, which would happen after, let's say, queen takes a8. 
game would end like this. Instead, bishop g5 was played. Once again, trying to hustle back to a defense with the king to h4, but bishop g5 gives up this block he had set up on the h file. And Dingler says, you know what? No. My dormant rook will join the party. Go to h8, threatening a discovered check, followed by checkmate, with the king. King g7 is looming. Baijinji decides to defend by attacking the rook on h8. Goes knight takes f7. When once again, many ways lead to Rome, but Ding Liren, you might have realized this by now, pretty good calculator, has found a forced way. He goes for bishop g6 check. No more quiet moves, forcing the white king to check on g4. If the king were to go to h4, the most convincing way is king g8 check. Knight takes h8, bishop takes g5 check, king takes g4, knight e5 checkmate. Cute little checkmate. But instead, king takes g4 was played, and ding. Mercilessly sacrifices a piece. Playing knight e5 check. And Baijin G had seen enough and resigned here. But of course, let's have a look at how the finish could have looked. Knight takes e5, bishop f5 check, king h5. King g7 check, and finally the rook on h8 gets his say. This king is out of squares. Bishop h6, rook takes h6, and checkmate. Quite a game by Ding Liren, and yeah, no matter what the objective evaluation in the opening, after he was given this chance, cb2, king e2, Ding Liren played absolutely perfect chess, played. Well, at some points, there were se several good moves, but he did not give Baijin G any chance to come back into the game. With all these hammer blows, like rook to d4, like king to g7. Very, very impressive game. And yeah, I had to click through it several times to figure out what's going on. I'm sure I still haven't spotted all the pretty lines, but I hope you guys enjoy this game as well. It's... Yeah, I'm sure it's in the running for Game of the Year. Or I should be careful with declarations, Game of the Decade, Century, whatever. It's a nice game. I think that what we can agree on. However, as it often happens in team championships, one game is not enough and Ding's team from Shenzhen, I'm sorry if I bungle that name very badly, actually went on to lose. They were outmatched here. Yakovenko winning on board number two and... Tianlugu winning on board number five. But Ding, I'm pretty sure we'll still be happy with that accomplishment. I hope you guys liked that game. If you are watching this before the end of the European Team Chess Championship 2017, by all means, tune in to the live commentary where today, once again, if you're watching this today, on November 5th, 2017. Is it the 5th? I think it's the 5th. There is a big, big encounter between top seed Russia and number two seed Azerbaijan, which I should now prepare a bit for. See you guys later. Thanks for watching.